Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Arianna, for your kind invitation and uh, also to the whole uh, uh, Coma Science group. Uh, my name is Tommaso Volpi. I'm from the University of Padova in Italy. And today I'm going to try to uh, give you a quick introduction to uh, FDG PET quantification and to the principles of FDG tracer kinetics. Now, uh, as Ariana nicely said in her introduction, uh, um, when we perform a PET experiment, we inject a radio tracer, a radio ligand, um, and we can then decide to uh, follow it dynamically over time. Um, for FDG, usually in a period of 60 minutes, one hour, um, and then reconstruct multiple PET images uh, that can give you a multi-frame representation of uh, what is happening to our tracer uh, in the body. And that is called uh, the uh, dynamic PET uh, framework. Or, uh, which is usually what is done in the clinical setting, we can decide to acquire a single snapshot, a static PET image, uh, usually at the end of the experiment, uh, around uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes uh, post-injection, uh, having therefore a single frame representation of the uptake of FDG in that uh, subject. And today we are going to try to understand a little bit why we can choose to make uh, um, one, of these, uh, um, one of these choices. Now, if we want to fully characterize what happens to FDG inside our brain, uh, we need to resort to a mathematical instrument that is called a compartmental model. In particular, um, I mean, for what concerns uh, FDG, we have a two tissue compartmental model uh, that uh, has been described for the first time in the 1970s uh, by Dr. Louis Sokolov. Uh, and it, it has two tissue compartments, uh, and three rate constants. K1 uh, describes the influx of the tracer from the arterial blood into the brain tissue, the first tissue compartment. K2 is instead the retrograde efflux into the venous blood. And K3 instead describes exactly what Ariana was saying before. So the phosphorylation of FDG uh, by the exokinase enzyme inside, uh, you know, neurons and glial cells. Uh, then we can combine the information, sorry, uh, okay, yeah, we can combine the information uh, from these three rate constants into a single rate constant that is called uh, a macro parameter that is called the KI, uh, which is equal to the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose uh, up to a given scale factor, which is called the lamp constant. Uh, so a lot of information that we can extract from uh, FDG PET, but how can we do it? So how can we estimate these parameters? We need two things, actually. Uh, we need an arterial input function, that is just the concentration of uh, uh, FDG, uh, the, the amount of FDG available in the arterial blood for exchanges with the brain tissue. And then we need uh, dynamic PET images. However, as you can see here in the, you know, the, the dashed red line and also here in, in, in black, the, the black circles and the black line, what we measure with dynamic PET is a combination of what happens in compartment one and compartment two. However, with compartmental modeling, we can nicely separate what happens in the first first compartment, which is the, uh, you know, the non-specific compartment of blood to tissue exchange from what happens in compartment two, which is actually uh, what we are in interested in. So the accumulation of the phosphorylated metabolized FDG. So if you look at what happens in the first part of the experiment, so uh, from time zero at the time of the injection to around 30 minutes after the injection, um, what we measure with, with uh, you know, our, our uh, PET frames uh, is mainly what is happening in the first compartment. And the first compartment is not what we are interested in because it's the non-specific uh, blood to tissue uh, exchange. So it's more related to blood flow than uh, actual glucose metabolism. If instead we focus on what is happening in the second part, 
So after 30 minutes, but even later, uh, 40, 45, uh, as you can see, uh, the, accumul the, um, the FDG, the, uh, which is phosphorylated, is linearly increasing and accumulating. And so in the end, we are going to measure something that is much more closely related to K3 and so to actual glucose metabolism. Um, Moreover, just one thing, you need to be mindful that what happens here is going to be dependent on the entire history of the system, because this is a dynamic system. So we need to be very careful, as Ariana was saying, about uh, what is happening immediately after we inject the, tr the tracer, because it's going to influence what we measure at the end of the experiment. So this is just to give you an idea of what we can get from the full kinetic quantification of FDG. However, it's quite difficult because we need the dynamic PET images, we need an arterial input function extracted from arterial samples usually, and complex mathematical modeling. So, uh, you know, many instruments have been devised to simplify uh, this uh, description. Uh, and today you are going to be explained a little bit more about this, uh, this one, so this semi-quantitative standard uptake value. Um, even though you must be mindful that, of course, uh, you know, going down with the complex complexity and simplifying, uh, we also lose some physiological information, but it's a trade-off, of course. And so finally, you are going to be explained a little bit more about, uh, you know, uh, SUV, which is something that we can derive from a single static image, uh, but it has been demonstrated that SUV is quite well correlated with KI and with cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. So we, we, are, we are still getting an information that is quite simple to acquire, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, relevant and informative on glucose metabolism. And finally, I just want to thank the, the people that taught me everything I know about uh, PET quantification and thank you all for the attention. So thank you very much.